Why I continue to torment myself is unclear to me. Although no, everything is clear, it's because of that bitch, Misty. Misty, the bitch I loved. Perhaps I became more thoughtful at this time of day at dawn. I wasn't like this before. I could calmly watch both sunset and sunrise and not think about it. This was when I was sleeping normally before. I'm getting ahead of myself. I met Misty in ninth grade. We quickly became friends because we had three lessons together. She seemed to be attracted to my bad guy image, although in fact, it was just an image. I carried a flask of whiskey to school and sometimes skipped classes, but that didn't make me James Dean. My family and my upbringing are to blame for this. What I have always liked most about Misty is her sincerity and honesty. She had a carefree sincerity that attracted people. She even took care of her little sister Angie, which was commendable. She didn't make friends with hypocritical people, so she didn't have many friends at school. Her strategy for getting around the school hierarchy was to simply avoid it. If one of the popular girls tried to hit on Misty, something bad would definitely happen to that girl. Moreover, Misty always found herself somewhere on the sidelines at such moments. She had some kind of extraordinary instinct. Jed Carruthers went to our school, even though he shouldn't have. Their home was in a nearby town, but as is often the case in the South, our West Texas school needed a quarterback. Jed was invited on the sly. He became a star while I was playing tight end or fullback, most often sitting on the bench. It never bothered me because Jed was really good and I wasn't. I blame my parents for this too. My father ran away and abandoned us when I was three years old, or so my mother said. I later learned from my uncle in Aberdeen that it was human coyotes that got dad into the ditch. Dad got involved with illegal substances and got into trouble. He had to pay off his debt by working as a courier. These were the days of coyote gangs before the war on drugs and the advent of organized cartels. These bastards didn't claim their kills. You made a mistake and you were sent to the ditch. End of story. Mom didn't live long after that. One night in the summer, between my freshman and sophomore years of high school, she got drunk and caused an accident, crashing into a tree just two blocks from our house. I stayed with my aunt, my mother's sister, and my uncle. I missed my mother a lot because we always talked about everything. Looking back, I was truly my mother's boy. My mother taught me to understand women, their emotions, their insecurities, what makes them happy, and I loved her for it. After her death, I realized that although I knew more about the intricacies of a woman than other guys my age, I did not understand the masculine side at all. That's when I decided to join the Navy. Misty and I lost our virginities to each other in February when she turned 18. I was four months older than Misty. She was the one who wanted to wait, although I didn't know why. I think she was afraid of her parents literally to death. Her father was a hot-tempered man. Sometimes when I came to pick up Misty, he would yell at me for no reason. Our first serious conflict happened the week before graduation. Jed Carruthers asked her to the prom, even though the whole school knew Misty and I were dating. Misty stood firm and told me that she politely turned down Jed, even though he invited her almost every day, but at the same time she demanded an official invitation from me. This pissed me off a little. We've been together long enough for this to be taken for granted. Everything was going great at the prom at first until Jed came up to our table and asked Misty to dance, pretending I didn't exist. In those few seconds, I could already imagine Misty turning him down and judging him for his bad manners. But this did not happen. She stood up without even looking in my direction and went to the dance floor. I was furious, but things got worse when she danced two fast dances with him, and then a slow one, and took liberties with him. She danced too close to him. I've seen enough. I've had enough, I said sharply, patting Carruthers on the shoulder. I'm taking her. What, Simpson? He giggled almost like a girl with a nasty grin, as if he couldn't believe his luck. Are you jealous? Actually, I cleared my throat. I was just being polite. Looks like your girlfriend just went out with Aaron and Glenn from the basketball team, most likely to smoke. Did you accidentally leave the car open? Jed's face immediately changed. I think he didn't believe me, but he found himself in a situation. 
If you do this, it's bad. If you don't do it, it's even worse. Words were unnecessary in the following seconds. Misty understood perfectly well what she had done wrong. I had no intention of humiliating her or myself on the dance floor, so I extended my hand to continue the dance. She exhaled heavily and, placing her head on my shoulder, hugged my neck. The rest of the evening did not go well. Jed didn't come to our table again, but I didn't expect that. He already achieved what he wanted. He ruined my evening. The ride home was tense and quiet. Misty and I were not used to such situations, so it was noticeable how nervous we both were. When we pulled up to Misty's house, I put the car in park and just looked at her. She did the same, but could not or did not want to say anything. Good night, Misty, I said, breaking eye contact and reaching for the gear shift. With a quiet sob, she got out of the car. A few short weeks later, Misty and I and our class graduated. I've been keeping her at a distance since the incident at prom, which made her really angry, and she started playing this stupid game called I'll Show You. I didn't ignore her, I just didn't spend as much time with her as before. Because I didn't give a clear answer about prom or parties after it, she stopped talking to me altogether. I'm sure it worked against both of us. I was cleaning out my closet on the last day of school when Misty walked up to me. She looked like she had decided to take action. Are you ever going to call me? She shouted with half tears. For what? I asked, without looking at her, continuing to do my job. Why is this so important to you? God, she responded with surprise. You're kidding, right? Are you my friend or not? I always thought yes until graduation, I answered indifferently. So it's because of this? She looked shocked, although she seemed to be playing. She was clearly worried about how things would turn out. Damn, Darren, are you still mad because I danced with Jed? Stop pretending, Misty, I growled. You know I'm angry. Stop playing. Stop being surprised. I know we didn't say we were dating exclusively, but you were the closest person to me, at least that's how I felt. We shared love and gave each other what was valuable to us. This freak didn't ask permission, he didn't even acknowledge my presence, and you followed his lead. Put yourself in my shoes and tell me how you would feel if I did the same to you. Misty looked down and lightly kicked the floor, as girls often do. She looked back at me to see that I was finally looking her straight in the eyes. I'm sorry if I offended you, Darren, she said, losing all her fighting spirit. Don't say this if you don't believe it, I besieged her. What are you apologizing for? For disrespecting you, she began, searching for words. For not asking your opinion, well, not your permission, but maybe I should have at least looked at you and hoped for your agreement. You're on the right track, I could continue to press her. She was still not entirely right, but she was no longer very wrong. I just didn't want to waste our last days arguing. I'm really sorry, Darren, she repeated. Should we go somewhere today? I miss us and want to make things right. Well, what about Jed? I asked, raising an eyebrow. It's over, she replied. A couple of dances, he allowed himself too much. I told him what an asshole he was in front of his friends in the cafeteria the Monday after graduation. It's time for my own confession, much too late. Misty knew I wanted to go to the Navy, but I never told her when. She probably thought we had the whole summer ahead of us. I can't, Misty. Her face showed shock and pain. We can go out for pizza or salad, but I have to get up early. The recruiter will pick me up at six in the morning to take me to the Navy physical. If I pass, I'll be sent out later this week. Misty's jaw dropped. I don't know why she looked so scared. Then her expression instantly changed. You heartless bastard, she said in a low tone. You were planning to leave and what, didn't you tell me? Misty held back a sob. I saw that she was in pain, and it didn't give me as much pleasure as I expected. She turned around and left. I took the physical and then sat down to discuss my options with some other guy. I told him that I wanted to learn something that my father never taught me. He offered a specialty in repairing diesel and heavy vehicles. This sounded a little extreme until he explained that at the end of the service, I would know everything about tools and technology. 
I might even be able to advance in something more specialized, like welding. I was interested in the idea, and it seemed better than, say, working in a galley, so I signed the contract. When I got home, Misty was sitting on the swing on the porch of my aunt's house. She looked terrible. Can we talk, Darren? She asked in a quiet voice. I nodded. Misty apologized again for dancing with Jed. She apologized for hurting me and said she now understood how I felt. She took my hand and cried. She thought we would have more time in the summer. I want you to take this. She took her grandmother's ring necklace from her pocket. This is my promise to you. You are special to me, more than I thought, and I want to wait for you. I'll be your girlfriend while you're away and I hope you feel the same. I want us to be together when you get back. Misty always had a way of making me emotional. I, I have nothing, I muttered. There is no jewelry to give you in return. Misty half smiled. Do you want me to wait for you? Darren, do you want us to be together? I nodded. Then give me your football jacket, she asked. And that t-shirt you'll wear to bed tonight so I can sleep with it. I understood what she meant. We went into the backyard and watched the sunset turn to darkness, and right there we vowed to be with each other. Misty had something else on her mind. Jed is still hitting on me, she said with some hesitation. After graduation. Did you do anything with him? Now I was unsure if I wanted to know the truth. Well, you know, kiss or something. Misty looked me straight in the eyes. No, but he made it clear that he wants to. He says how much he likes me and how much I will love him if I give him a chance. Is this why you want us to agree on our future? I asked. No, she answered immediately. I, well, I think I love you for real. I don't want us to rush into this, so I just want to be your girlfriend while you're away. And it will help me get rid of Jed. He is very persistent. I know he won't stop when he finds out you've left. This will help. We made promises to each other and discussed how and when we could keep in touch. I didn't really understand this, but I told her that I would return home after school. She said she would start looking for a job right away. We watched the orange sky turn to black and kissed each other goodbye. I liked the fleet, or rather, the fleet and I suited each other. With the exception of school, everything was even fun. My first serious assignment was on a destroyer in the Mediterranean, where I learned to use air tools and huge wrenches and later welding. When I was on vacation, Misty was still my girlfriend. We spent almost all our time together, but it always seemed to me not enough. Although I wasn't the smartest guy in the world, I wasn't born yesterday. Misty was a beauty. Jed was already chasing her, which meant that the others wouldn't miss their chance while I was gone. I signed up for four years, so I didn't expect total devotion, even though the idea of dating while I'm away came from her. When you have too high hopes for someone, unrealistic expectations, you need to be prepared for disappointment. So I thought I was keeping an open mind, especially with Jed. The fact that Misty wanted to be known as my girlfriend, especially in my absence, meant a lot to me. This indicated that she would not allow Jed to openly court her. It also meant that if she messed up with someone during the four years I was gone, it would be done quietly. Such thoughts were reinforced in my head because she never talked about an engagement or any other more serious promise. I appreciated Misty for that, even though I was still angry about prom. Knowing Jed, I wanted to believe that Misty could keep her promises, but he was a guy who was used to getting whatever he wanted. His family was the same, and they probably taught him this from an early age. Being a star quarterback only confirmed what he had been told since childhood. Misty took care of my heart in a way, but at the same time she didn't overdo it and didn't make promises that would burden both of us. However, she had already rejected Jed more than once, probably even publicly humiliating him. He wasn't going to give up. I could only hope that Misty would do the right thing. She solemnly promised that it would be so. In response, I was ready to turn a blind eye to her minor misdeeds, although our agreement was based on silence and mutual respect. I didn't want to be a hypocrite either. Of course, I had fun with my colleagues in many ports, and although I only spent the night with an educated woman once, I never refused pleasure or caresses with my hands, 
unless the lady looked like she would have to take penicillin after it. I never asked Misty about other guys when I came home on vacation. We had too much to talk about, and I didn't think these issues would lead to anything productive for our future. Misty got a part-time job at a local bar, Bronco, a dance bar with live music in the evenings and a large dance floor. When she told me about this, I began to worry about her even more. She was beautiful, and the whole city knew it, including herself. All this fun life ended late in my third year of service during a two-hour nightmare in the Sardinian Sea, one sunny Saturday afternoon. On the aft deck of our destroyer, poorly stored fuel barrels somehow caught fire, and literally everyone rushed onto the deck to stop the spread of the fire. And then there was an explosion, and that's when all hell broke loose. I was about 40 yards from the epicenter of the explosion, but my ears were still ringing terribly. The eyes saw only horror. My comrades, doused in fuel and engulfed in flames, screamed. I saw their screams with my eyes, but did not hear them with my ears. I think I was squatting when someone grabbed my wrists. Then I felt a strong blow. Move your ass, sailor, shouted the bloody deck lieutenant. This is an order. At that moment I saw and heard a second explosion. Of the 198 members of our crew, 76 fell into the water. Only 46 survived that day. Many of the survivors, including me, suffered hearing damage. People who are even minimally or partially deaf are not qualified to serve in the Navy. Regardless of compensation, many of my co-workers, including myself, were honorably discharged. The worst for me were the dreams. This is when I could sleep at all. The first week in a German military hospital was terrible. Every time I reached REM sleep, variations of what I saw in real life unfolded before me. The dreams gradually softened and decreased in frequency by the time I returned home. I stayed in Norfolk for two months under observation. I think the Navy wanted to make sure I was okay before firing me, or perhaps they were trying to figure out if I was worthy of being fired. I would have gone crazy during those two months if it weren't for one of my co-workers, Dan Wilkins. He was a petty officer of the first class who was promoted to junior lieutenant. On that fateful day, he earned his stripes as a lieutenant commander literally under fire. Lieutenant Dan, as he was teased, was not amputated in the accident. However, he suffered third-degree burns on one side of his face and body while rescuing the crew. Dan had a positive outlook on life, and our conversations helped me put aside the horror of what happened. Another person who helped me keep my sanity was Misty. I wrote her the first letter from Germany, and her answer arrived on the day of my return to Norfolk. My second letter probably confused her, but then I was able to talk to her on the phone from my room. My phone was lost or destroyed during the incident, and I was unable to purchase a new one. The Navy made sure to notify my aunt and uncle. They were just about to come to me when I found out about my dismissal. Misty seemed very concerned about my condition, and clearly more than usual. She would either start or end our conversations with persistent and even slightly agitated questions about how I was really feeling. I reassured her all the time, but I also felt that everything had changed, I had changed, and definitely not for the better. What happened that day fundamentally changed me. What I was telling my assigned Navy therapist was not entirely true. I had so many thoughts and emotions competing with each other in my head that I couldn't figure out exactly what was bothering me. This only caused more confusion, and I began to dread returning home. One thing I knew for sure, I needed Misty now more than ever. Finally, I was fired and returned home. Misty and my family met me at the airport. Misty cried, sobbed, and held me in her arms for a long time. My uncle put his hands on my shoulders, looked into my eyes and nodded slightly, showing that he understood everything. I moved in with my aunt and uncle and continued to recover. Misty was with me every day. This was despite the fact that she was now working full-time at Bronco. She tried to get me to open up and talk about what I was going through, and I shared some things with her because I loved her. However, I hid a lot of things out of shame. I didn't want her to see me as something less a lesser man, a lesser life partner. I still felt terrible guilt for standing still on the deck instead of saving my comrades. 
my uncle got me a temporary job at Smitty's auto repair shop in our city. This was another blow to my pride. With my naval experience, I was clearly overqualified for the job, but I had lost hearing in one ear and only had 50% function in the other. I needed a hearing aid for the ear that was still working, but the eardrum in the other ear was ruptured beyond repair. This left me legally disabled, although I made a full recovery from burns, three broken fingers, cracked ribs, and a broken collarbone. My naval career was over, and I now faced an uphill battle to advance in my chosen profession. Misty was my rock. I did my best to respond in kind, but I knew that in the first months I fell short. However, Misty didn't hesitate for a second when I proposed to her and nearly broke another rib while screaming, Yes. The wedding was modest, and my uncle paid for our honeymoon to Hawaii on the island of Maui, which made us both very happy. One of those nights, as we lay in the hammock and watched the sun set below the Pacific horizon, Misty asked me a question. Darren, she began, squeezing my hand, is this the same sight that you saw while on the ship? Yes, I answered her. The only thing missing was you. She thought about my words, but she was clearly preoccupied with something else. Are you feeling better at last? Can we start talking about our future? Maybe it's time to think about children when we get home. I want to know what we need to take the house. Or at least an apartment if we can't get a loan. Do you think we're ready? I knew that this conversation would happen someday, and I was ready for it. I wanted to make her happy. She was my friend and had proven her devotion to me as a friend many times over. Yes, dear, I replied with a grin. I'm ready. Sorry it took me a while. Even before my wedding, I went to the VA to sign up for several job lists and took out documents to receive a loan from the Veterans Administration. We earn enough to buy a small house, but if we decide to have children right away, we will have to earn more. Misty thought about it, but she seemed pleased that I had thought it through and taken some action ahead of time. As it turns out, her father, Ralph, gave us a single-family mobile home when we returned. Misty's little sister, Angie, helped clean and furnish the house in our absence. Although the sisters were never particularly close, Angie was always kind to me, and I liked that. She was always a little bit jealous of Misty. Our house was on the back of one of Ralph's friend's ranches, so we lived alone. But we had our own road. Life continued throughout the first and part of the second year of our marriage. Misty and I quickly realized that we weren't financially ready to have children, so we decided to wait another year or two. My job at Smitty's Body Shop became full-time, and Misty took on an extra shift at the Bronco. We both worked six days a week with almost no time for ourselves. We spent the remaining time together in the best possible way. Our sex life was always very good, and Misty reciprocated and I felt her love, which made everything especially meaningful to me. However, we were often too tired and postponed intimacy until the next evening or even later. It killed our spontaneity, but I understood our circumstances. However, being so busy was beneficial for me as I had to focus on my work. By then the dreams had almost stopped. I still dreamed about them, and at times I felt uneasy, but overall I felt better. A little later, after our first anniversary, a position as a bouncer opened up at the Bronco, and Misty encouraged me to apply. I talked to other bouncers and my wife to learn about the customers and how they were treated by the waiters. It was a typical West Texas bar with live entertainment five nights a week. The bouncers explained to me that most of the waitresses, including Misty, knew where to draw the line. After all, they worked for tips. I had to learn to spot the signs when something was wrong so that I could be prepared to protect the waitresses and other customers if something happened. When Missy came on shift the next night, I was still there, going through a little orientation with the rest of the bouncers. Misty, seeing me with the guys, immediately realized that I got the job and, jumping joyfully, rushed towards me with kisses and hugs. Misty was very good at the game, as she called it. She knew how to flirt and even make rude remarks with a smile on her face. She allowed clients to play this game and pretended to play it herself. It was clear that she liked the compliments that were showered on her and, of course, the generous tips. 
During this period, I felt that misty and I began to move in slightly different directions. I couldn't understand what was going on. She spent more and more time with her friends from the club and I became more and more withdrawn. Yes, looking back on our first two years after marriage, I realized that everything had changed. I was often on edge, or on the contrary, too relaxed. Misty often repeated herself and could get irritated. I thought it was my hearing, but she said I was flying in the clouds. My military GP was stationed in Aberdeen, which was quite a long way from our home. She was a good woman, patient, which I liked. I couldn't really explain my feelings. She didn't feel sorry for me or show any regret, but she wrote down a lot. This was fine with me because I already had enough pity at home and at work. The relationship with Misty developed. I knew she loved me because she treated me with love. That wasn't the problem. There was something missing from our closeness, and I felt it. When I told my therapist about this, she surprised me by asking if I thought it was me who was withdrawing. For some reason, this made me especially angry. She made a few more notes. It was a week after Halloween when everything suddenly came at me from all sides. I don't think it had anything to do with me directly, but others thought otherwise. One morning, a semi-regular customer arrived at the store in his Mercedes, and as soon as he got out of the car, I immediately knew there was going to be trouble. He entered the workshop as if he owned it, looked around and headed towards Harry, the mechanic who had recently been working on his car. Approaching him, he started shouting at him. I couldn't hear what was being said due to the noise of the instruments and problems with my hearing, but I saw everything perfectly. This fat man, with a cigar in his mouth, poked his finger in Harry's face, and I realized that he was about to lose his temper. I quickly approached them. By that time, the fat one was already waving his finger in front of Harry's face, so I gently but firmly grabbed his shoulder. But before I could say anything, the fat man turned around and punched me, cursing me as I struggled to stay on my feet. He then tried to kick me below the belt. He missed the blow, but when I realized what he was trying to do, my mind was blown. I hit him right in the solar plexus and gave him two loud slaps in the face. It seemed to me that I was defending myself since he attacked me first. Harry and our boss pulled me away from him as I stood over him. I just gave him a couple of slaps, but he got up from the ground and started yelling at the boss, demanding that I be fired. I was sure that I was acting in self-defense and could not understand why the boss was yelling at me, telling me to get out. Before I really realized what was happening, I was fired. Misty was very upset when I came home and told her everything. When I realized that she was angry with me, I was completely confused. You need to get help, Doran, she said in a strange tone. I want you to go to another therapist. Did you even listen to me? I answered sharply, defensively. This has nothing to do with my PTSD or any anger issues. This guy attacked me when I was trying to defuse the situation. Harry couldn't defend himself, and I defended him and myself. You should be on my side. I didn't do anything wrong. She looked at me with some confusion, then softened. Okay, okay, but I still think you should consult another specialist. Please, for us. This made me even more angry. She should have been on my side. But I didn't shout or argue. I just left and didn't return home until one in the morning. Misty got mad at me for that too. The situation at home was tense for several days. Misty asked for my Navy therapist's number and even went to see her herself. She no longer insisted that I see another doctor, but she made sure that I did not miss appointments. However, she never apologized. I started to think that maybe it was the medications my GP prescribed for me. My mood became more euphoric, I would say. I often wanted to please my wife, take her somewhere, or just go shopping with her in Aberdeen but then the desire disappeared somewhere. I couldn't understand why I was losing interest so suddenly. Maybe I was just tired or something distracted me. I always felt guilty when it came back to me. The few evenings I worked at the Bronco coincided with Misty's work shifts, which made our lives easier, which made her especially happy. Those evenings when we returned home together were some of the best of our married life. Usually, when we got home, 
Misty would go straight to the shower to get rid of the Bronco smell and often invited me to join her. We started in the shower and then continued in the bedroom, but not to sleep. After such nights, it was difficult for me to work the next day in the store, but I tried. One day, out of the blue, I went to lunch at a seedy bar with some former auto body shop colleagues I'd been trying to keep in touch with since I'd been fired. Nothing serious, just a distraction. I had never been to or drank in this bar before. The waitress was great, not a beauty, but she had such enthusiasm and a way of moving that was quite funny. I had never seen her in town before, so I was surprised when she gave me a note along with the check. Don't look at her until you're alone, she winked with a mischievous smile. When we returned to the workshop, I went to the restroom and looked at the note. What I read there shocked me. Your wife is cheating on you. I froze, shock turning to anger and then rage. My suspicions that Misty and I were growing apart suddenly became clear but I had to be careful and not jump to conclusions. How do you feel knowing that your wife may be cheating on you? The therapist asked me at the next session. What do you think? I was on the verge of a breakdown. I thought that we were getting closer, but now I see that on the contrary, we are moving away. I don't know what to think except the worst, and it makes me angry, really angry. I can't blame you for this situation, she replied sympathetically. But keep in mind that people in town know about your PTSD, and this creates a certain reputation, deserved or not. I can't tell you exactly how to react, but I advise you to think it through carefully. The best thing to do is to remain calm, be reasonable, and have the situation under control. If you let your anger control you, you'll lose control and people will just nod and say, oh well, he's still broken and shouldn't be messed with. Please consider this, even if you are inclined to think about divorce. But let's start from the beginning, she continued before I could say anything. At this point, you don't know for sure if it's true, do you? I nodded because she was right. You say you don't know the woman who gave you the note, so even though the thought of your wife cheating on you is haunting you, don't you need to confirm it somehow first? Yes, I answered, sighing tiredly. But I don't know how to prove it, and it's killing me. Darren, she said, leaning forward, you're in a vulnerable position right now. Your nightmares have almost stopped, which is good. But you still experience a feeling of apathy, which is directly related to depression. I know, I answered her. What should I do? I can't tell you exactly what to do regarding your wife. But what I can suggest is to focus on yourself. No matter how true the note was, you cannot control Misty or the actions she may take. Focus on yourself, Darren. When your thoughts start to wander to what Misty is or is not doing, ask yourself, what can I do for myself now that will be more helpful? I took her advice seriously and promised to change my behavior. This did not calm my anger or dispel my suspicions. Two months later, we had a quarrel one quiet evening. Misty didn't work that day, and I was glad she was home. There was a big guy sitting in the corner of the bar with a drink. Then two thin guys came, and he joined them. Somewhere in the chaos, the bartender and waitress disagreed on his bill, even though the waitress had brought drinks for his friends. And before anyone realized what was happening, the big guy started yelling at the bartender, who, by the way, was a really impudent person and loved to show off his bravado to the customers, and then turned his attention to the waitress. One of the other bouncers moved closer to intervene if things got out of hand. We were all shocked when the big guy, still shouting at the waitress, suddenly turned around and knocked out our fellow bouncer with his fist. My partner and I immediately rushed to him and were able to tie him up, although it was not easy. The police were already arriving when we finally took control of it. The situation was aggravated by the fact that the impudent bartender, jumping over the bar counter, began hitting and kicking this guy, shouting insults as he went. It was a long evening for me. I communicated with the police and completed all necessary incident reports as part of my job. The arrogant bartender was fired that night. Misty was horrified when I came home and told her what happened. Do you think he might come back when he gets out? She asked worriedly. I don't think he'll be released unless someone posts a hefty bail, I reassured her. 
At that point, I decided to go to the bar on my days off when she was working. This should have made her feel safe and probably appreciate my concern even more. The next night, while Misty was at work, I walked into the bar after my shift. I didn't bother going home to take a shower or change clothes, so I looked, to put it mildly, unkempt. The owner of the bar saw me immediately and motioned to me to come to his office. I looked around the room but didn't see Misty, so I headed towards it. Doran, he said as soon as I closed the door, we have a problem. He paused and motioned for me to sit down. Doran, Misty has been a valued employee since the first day she started working here, he began again. I hope you will allow her to continue working here after I finish my story. The fact is that that big guy sued us, mostly because of that cheeky little bartender, but he also claims that you hit him too. Between the legs, I reviewed the camera footage, but damn it, I can't prove that you didn't do it. The cameras are placed at bad angles. He looked at me as if I should understand something more than he said. After a moment of silence, he continued. Durin, he said, I'll have to let you go, son. I don't want this, but my lawyer said this is the best way to protect the club. It makes no sense, Hoss, I replied. Sometimes, boy, it happens, he replied. How do you want to get your last paycheck? When he handed me the cash I asked for, I went out to the bar. One of the bartenders came up to me and took me aside behind the main bar, out of sight. There, at the service bar, stood Misty, and next to her, too close and too friendly, was Jed Carruthers. Jack, the bartender, nodded in their direction and then spoke, Dude, I overheard your conversation with Hoss, and I don't want to get you in trouble, but they've been acting like this a lot lately. That's all I saw, but I thought you should know. I thanked him and tried to collect my thoughts before entering the hall. They both saw me when I approached. Carruthers leaned close to Misty's ear, said something, and then looked the other way. I'm pretty sure I saw a confident smile, as if he had taken from me something that I had not yet lost. What the hell was he doing here? I asked immediately. And what were you talking about? Not now, Durin, she scolded me. I am working. I'll explain when I get home. You will explain now, I said, standing in front of her. Listen, she said with an exasperated sigh. Calm down. Nothing happens. He was just talking to me, okay? Now I need to deliver these drinks. None of us can afford to lose our jobs, so let's discuss this at home. You can't afford to lose your job, I replied. Mine is no longer there. I turned and left. As I headed out, Jed grinned at me from his desk, where he joined his friends. It was that grin that foreshadowed trouble. Misty was standoffish and apologized when she got home. Starting the conversation by discussing my dismissal seemed to be her strategy, as I understood it. Finally, when she had exhausted the topic, I asked her about Jed. We were just talking, she said in an annoyed tone. There is nothing between us. Talking is one thing. But does it always hang over you when I'm not around? I guess that doesn't mean anything either. What did he tell you? Misty's face changed. A cold determination appeared in her gaze. Durin, we're friends, okay? We talk sometimes. This is nothing. This is not the answer. I began to get angry. That doesn't explain why he was so close to you, why he looked at me as if you belonged to him. Was I the only one who noticed this? and that's just today. What happens when I'm not there? How long have you been good friends? Misty thought about her words. It was clear from the rapid movement of her eyes that I would not believe a word she said, even before she said it. We are already friends. She looked at the wall behind me. For a long time, since you left for the Navy, he stopped trying to get me into bed because he knew I loved you. He was a friend, a friend and a gentleman. I stood there, numb and angry. I was ready to unleash the full force of my disappointment on her, given her confession. I thought about what the therapist said about control before responding. I was sure that the upcoming dispute would be the beginning of the end for us. Gentlemen, you say, I blurted out. You stand there and say that he's been hanging around you since I first went on duty. He didn't drive you into a corner, didn't force you. Just talk. 
Nonsense, Misty. That's not in character for Jed or any of the Carothers, and you know it, Misty. Be honest for once, even if it hurts. Misty's next actions shocked me the most. She stood with an aggressive posture until she burst into tears. I can't, she said, sobbing. I can't do this anymore. I don't know if I can. She wiped her nose with a kitchen towel and tried to pull herself together. I want my husband back, she said quietly and softly. You, Durin, I want you to come back. Something happened to you on that ship. I know the terminology and I know the medications you are taking. I just want the Durin back that I loved before you left. I don't know what to do. She began to sob again. You get up in the morning and look at the damn sunrise. You sit there and watch it set, and everything I tell you falls on deaf ears. I tried. I tried to be a good and understanding wife. You know I am. I wasn't going to interrupt her because I didn't know what to say. I was talking to my friends, she continued. Women are such bitches. Dump that mechanic, they say, or you can have anyone in this town, honey. Wake up. I stopped communicating with them, you know. She looked at me as if I should understand. In fact, I told them to go to hell. And who does that leave? Jedha. He listened. He gave advice. Yes, he sometimes became too persistent. After all, he is a man, but when I tell him off, he always apologizes. I'll go to my mom to think about it, Durin. You need to think, too. I want our lives back. I want us the way we were alive and vibrant, not half dead and not talking or listening to each other. I'll call you in a few days. With that, Misty went into the bedroom, gathered a few things in a bag and left, kissing me on the cheek without saying another word. The next morning the sunrise was amazing. The day was clear and cool, and the sun was rising in the south. Autumn has come into its own. I watched as the fireball fully appeared. My life was a complete mess. Misty was right about some of the things she said, and yet she was honest. I knew this because I knew her. My therapist called it PTSD, but only a few times. I think they are taught to be careful with this, or maybe they think that a person can heal faster if the diagnosis is not constantly in front of their eyes. By then I knew it wasn't my poor hearing when I zoned out while Misty was saying something. I've done this to many other people in my life. Nobody wanted to talk about it openly. To them I was a hero. I experienced something unimaginable to them. Sometimes I wished they would tell me this directly. Misty stayed with her mom for more than a few days. I called her, usually ending up with her mother. Tell her I love her, I always ended the conversation. But I couldn't get Jed out of my mind. We knew each other from school. His grandfather made his fortune in oil, although he was a geologist by profession. He was good at finding this black jewel. He found more than 50 fields, installed drilling rigs on them, and let the oil flow. Jed's father later leased some of the land where oil had dried up to radio and cell phone companies. They needed places to set up towers, and Jed's father was in the right place at the right time right at the beginning of the cell phone boom. Jed's parents bought a huge house in West Palm Beach, Florida, while I was in the Navy. Jed lived in their old house, a five-room mansion on 42 acres of land. Misty didn't disappear. We talked at night, sometimes for a long time. I missed her very much. At the beginning of the second week, I told her my work schedule so she knew when I was available to talk or meet. On two of those nights I said I would work until eleven, but that was a lie. The hill was not a hill, but more like a huge pile of sand, washed up by centuries of West Texas winds. I turned off the headlights as soon as I turned the car away from Jed's house. I quietly crawled to the edge until I saw Jed's house. Then I took out my binoculars and started adjusting the focus. I followed them from the Bronco and decided to find out. When I saw the bedroom light come on on the second floor, I headed towards the house, down the small hill. To the right of the house was an open shed with gardening equipment. I noticed two five-liter cans of gasoline. I thought about them for a second but quickly decided that I would not give up the pleasure of looking into his eyes. As I approached the base of the stairs, I heard muffled voices rather than groans. It took me a few minutes to decide whether to wait for what would happen next or not. As I carefully walked up the stairs, 
the words I began to make out were almost as terrible as the sounds I expected to hear. Then why are you here? A male voice asked irritably. We discussed this over and over again. You will never be happy with him. He's crazy. Back off, my wife answered without hesitation. You have no right to talk about him like that. What happened to him is not his fault. I wonder how you would sit now if this happened to you. It doesn't matter, Jed argued. We can build a life together. I can give you something you couldn't even dream of with him. I want to be with you, can't you see? You can feel sorry for this guy all you want, but it won't change anything. I heard rustling and creaking bed springs. Come on, Misty, you know deep down it's right it feels right, and you know it. Let me love you. You know how good it feels when we have sex. You can't stop moaning and screaming, and you always need more. Let me take you and treat you the way you deserve. So, the rumors were confirmed. My wife is a woman of easy virtue. My wife certainly didn't abuse me, but she didn't really protect me either. Otherwise, she wouldn't be sitting on Jed Carruthers' bed. You just don't understand, Jed, she said more forcefully. You are so used to your silver spoon that it has become a part of you. You don't know what struggle is. You don't know what sacrifice is. This is Duran. This was his life, even before the Navy. He is no longer the same man I married, but I still love him. I let you take over me when he was abroad. I felt terrible about it, but then I let you into my life again, and we did it again. But this is wrong. Yes, the sex is good, but that's all. It relieves tension and helps me relax. Think about it. I'm cheating. Is this the person you want to love? I decided to intervene at this point because I didn't think I could handle any more revelations. Hello, lovers, I said monotonously. Their necks turned so quickly that I was surprised they didn't break. Misty's face showed horror. I was sure that she did not expect that this was how she would be exposed. Jed, on the other hand, looked like the cat that caught the canary. His face expressed surprise, which quickly gave way to a wide, smug smile. Oh, look who it is. Jed was enjoying this sudden intrusion too much. I walked to the foot of the bed and pointed the gun at his head. No, don't, Durin, Misty exclaimed in panic. Please, honey, don't kill him. Let's leave right now and calmly talk about this. I noticed that Misty might have protested, but she had only been here a few minutes and her chest was already half exposed. She still had her clothes on, though. Are you sure you don't want to stay and finish what you had planned, Misty? I pointed with my other hand at her unkempt appearance. Yes, honey, Jed said mockingly. Stay. Let a real man love you, not some crazy loser. Misty looked at Jed with great curiosity. Then she looked at me and back at Jed. I couldn't understand what she was trying to understand, but she seemed to realize that she was in big trouble of her own making. Misty stared at the gun. Durin, she spoke again, trying to be the voice of reason. Please, let's leave. I didn't want you to find out like this. I know you're upset, but I think. Do you know I'm upset? I asked her incredulously. What? Hanging out with this asshole lowers your ick by several levels. I thought you were better than this. You were better. And now I hear that you and him have been together all this time. I'm sure the whole city already knows about it. Suddenly it hurts to realize that your wife is an easy bitch, not when you notice it while holding a gun. Did you sleep with that loser while I was on duty? Yes, Jed exclaimed proudly. She and I have been close for a long time, and this continues. You're in my house and you're disturbing me, so get the hell out. Misty gave him a look that could have melted steel. I didn't know what pissed her off more, the fact that he finally spilled everything or the way he said it, but she was furious. I didn't know if he was deliberately provoking me to shoot him. In his situation, he shouldn't have been so cocky and smug. My wife seemed as shocked by this as I was. She knew him better and probably realized that his behavior was extremely inappropriate. Jed was clearly enjoying my confusion and ran the back of his hand through Misty's hair as if to mock me. In shock, I lowered the gun a little. Misty pulled away from him abruptly, a look of disgust appearing on her face. It's like school, Benchy, Jed taunted. People like me never lose. 
Now give the gun to your wife and just turn around and walk away. Or you can stay and watch if you like. Hell, you might even learn something. Be that as it may, I can't wait. Shut up, Jed, Misty yelled at him. Stop provoking and humiliating him. You don't know him like I do. Do you really want to be killed? If he wanted to do something, he would have done it already, Jed continued. He knows my daddy will destroy him if he does this. He'll go to jail and dad will make sure he suffers every day until he's killed slowly. I raised the gun and pointed it straight at Jed. He still smiled confidently and brazenly, as if he refused to believe that I was ready for this. Misty quickly stepped between him and the weapon. Misty, I asked, are you really ready to protect him with yourself? Does he mean that much to you? Misty walked up to me while this idiot continued to tempt fate behind her back. She was at arm's length, and I couldn't understand her face. She looked, determined. Give me the gun, Durin, she ordered quietly. That won't happen. Yeah, you heard her, Benchy, Jed taunted again. That won't happen. Shut up, Jed, Misty said calmly, not taking her eyes off me. She slowly reached for the gun. I held it right next to her chest. Durin, she said softly again. It wasn't a question. I'm sure she saw the hesitation in my eyes. I wanted to kill him. In my anger, I wasn't sure I wanted her to live. In that moment of indecision, Jed probably saw an opportunity, the chance that I will listen to her. Misty grabbed the gun, turning to the left, and Jed grabbed my hand with incredible speed. All three of them held the gun with all their strength, and a commotion ensued. I was determined not to lose this fight, but I also didn't want Misty to get hurt. A shot rang out and my hand released the weapon. I looked at Misty, her side was pressed against me, but she stood motionless. Jed's scream caught my attention, and I saw that he had been shot in the neck. The look of surprise on Jed's face will stay with me for the rest of my life as I watch the life leave his body. Only a few seconds passed before he collapsed onto his side on the bed. Misty turned to me, and now my Glock was pointed at me. Misty, don't, I begged, unable to comprehend what had happened. Sit down, Durin, she ordered calmly. Take your two pills. Come on, do it. Still in shock, I listened to her. Why, was my simple question. When she saw the rage leave my eyes, she lowered her weapon and turned to look at Jed. Because, she replied, I had to. That's not the answer, I objected. You risked your life. Why did you do this? You loved him, didn't you? Misty turned sharply to me. I... No, that's not true. Enough lies. She thought for a moment, sighed, and continued. I didn't plan for him to attack us, so the situation got out of hand. I love you, she said with some humility. I think I like the idea of it. He's been watching me since the day you joined the army. The more I resisted, the more it became a challenge for him. Somewhere along the way, he decided to stop trying for a while to become my friend to get into my head. And in the end, I bought it. No, I let it happen. It became a permanent part of my life, and I was lonely. We had our own story. I gave myself to him when you were gone. But what I told him is true. It was just sex, nothing more. When we weren't together, we had nothing but self-loathing. But lately, she continued, wiping her face again, ever since you came back, you haven't been without guilt either. You have changed. I was worried about you. I was worried to death about us. He calmed those fears. I'm embarrassed to admit, but I told him all the details of our life. He listened, consoled, but couldn't stand it. And I gave in again because I missed you. We haven't been together in ages, and I'm tired of all the guys at the bar hitting on me. I probably went with what I knew. I'm sorry. I don't know what other words to choose. Then why did you shoot him? It didn't fit in my head. Because, she replied, he lied to me and talked about me as if I were a street girl that he just picked up and used. I felt like he was only using me to humiliate you, and you don't deserve it. He said he had me, not made love, and bragged like he was the only man who knows how to please a woman by putting you down, and I freaked out. I thought you'd kill him anyway. He lied, and you were going to kill him. I couldn't let this happen. Your life has been hard enough as it is. 
Did he lie to you? I asked again, still not understanding the whole picture. And when did you understand this? Honestly, right here on the bed, she admitted. He spoke so well of you, said that he studied your condition, and gave me advice on how to help you. But here, in just ten minutes, he began to humiliate you with such hatred, and then I realized that all this time he had been lying to me. Did you really come here to have sex with him? I couldn't look at her. Yes, she answered almost immediately. You were getting worse. I told myself that I needed to see for myself whether we, he and I had, a future. Why didn't you just tell me how you felt? I asked. Oh, I told you, Durin, she replied with some venom in her voice. God, you were sitting on the couch, just staring at the TV, the wall, or the window. I tried, I tried, but you rarely answered. I looked at the bed. Misty sensed the change in my thoughts. Come on, honey, she encouraged. Let's go now. We'll drive all night to my sister's house in Ventura. There are no surveillance cameras on these roads, so we won't be spotted until Albuquerque. But we won't take I-10. We will take bypass roads. We can get to Vegas by tomorrow night. We can even stay there for the night, gamble at the casino, and put on happy faces so we won't be suspected when the police get the CCTV footage. They won't find him right away. Time is on our side. Even in my current state, I could see the flaws in her plan, but she was at least half right. I stood up, and she gave me back my grandfather's gun. We held hands and walked out of Jed's house to her car. I couldn't imagine ever holding her hand again. How did you get here? She asked, looking around. Up there, I pointed to the eastern rise. Take me there to pick up my truck. Without saying a word, we got into the car. She pulled into the driveway, then turned onto the main road and drove to the site about a quarter of a mile away. When she parked next to my truck, I turned the key in her ignition and turned off the engine. She looked at me with an expression of shock, but also understanding. You know what you need to do, I said, squeezing her hand. Just keep going as long as you can, don't stop unless you feel tired, and only stop when you feel sleepy. I'll take care of everything here. No, she said firmly, and then her voice became more desperate. No, you must come with me. Let's do it like I said at home. We could be somewhere else. Somewhere where we'll have an alibi. Please, Duran, I don't want to lose you. You know you won't lose me, I assured her. Based on what I heard when I walked into Jed's bedroom, she had already lost me. She'll never be my wife again, but damn, she's been my friend for so long. I'll come a little later. I know what needs to be done here, but you don't. One of us needs to distance ourselves from this. Misty knew I was right. She also knew that she had caused all of this. She could have told Jed to go to hell a long time ago, or at least yesterday. She could have simply divorced me and gone to him. She could have taken dozens of small steps to avoid this. Promise me right now, she looked into my eyes, like she did at school. Promise me you'll come see my sister in California. I said I'll come. I don't know if she believed me, but she finally kissed me and accepted the inevitable. I got into my truck, and when Misty put it in gear, I noticed that her face was covered in tears. I love you, Duran, she said tearfully. I know, I replied. I loved her too. I almost told her about it, but after all the revelations I couldn't. She looked so lost. I wanted Jed to pay, but he already did. Now only my task remains. I waited until her taillights disappeared into the distance. What I really wanted was for her to turn the car around and come back. Then I started the truck and drove back to Jed's house, turning off the headlights. Jed didn't have enough rugs. I went to his garage and then to the large shed, making a mental note of what I would need. The first thing I took were work gloves, then shovels, a scoop and two five-liter cans of gasoline. Then I came up with another idea. I looked around, almost lost hope but then I found a roll of mesh of the right length. Luckily, Jed had large windows with screens. I found the right rope. I then went back into the house and checked the cleaning supplies. I didn't need much for my plan, but I had to remove all traces of Misty from this house. I took 60-gallon trash bags and put them in the bed of my truck. 
then took two more bags into the bedroom, where I put Jed's legs in one bag and pulled the other over his head and torso. He was a big guy, but I put him on my shoulder and carried him to the truck. I tied the net to the rear side of the body so that it lightly touched the ground. I then followed the fire trails to the edge of his property. Using a shovel and hoe, I dug a shallow grave. My goal was not to hide it, but to attract the attention of wildlife. The vultures and other birds will start pecking at it almost immediately after I leave. My four-legged friends from Texas will finish the job if the police don't find him too quickly. It took longer than I thought. He was tall in addition to being large. Returning to the house, I returned all the tools to their places. He took the garbage bags into the bedroom along with the clothes he was wearing. I still had a change of clothes in the truck from work. I then set about removing all traces of Misty from the house. I had to guess which rooms she might have been in. I changed the sheets on the bed, hoping to confuse the investigation, although I knew it was probably a waste of time. I had about half an hour before dawn, so I grabbed a beer from his refrigerator and sat on the porch to think about everything that had happened. I loved Misty, of that I was sure. Her betrayal hurt me so much that I didn't think I could forgive her. It wasn't that she could have had sex with Jed that night, but that their relationship had been going on for a long time and was deeply hidden. She lied to me about this over and over again. Why did she end up killing him? I may never know. If I don't get accused of killing Jed, I might find her one day and ask her why she did it. As I sat on the porch, the beer ran out and I glanced at the familiar landscape on the horizon. The orange sky was like an old friend to me. I shuddered as the new day began to dispel the night's chill. I loved the way the light interacted with the clouds just before sunrise. The storm was already brewing in central Texas, based on the clouds, and as is often the case this time of year, it will hit the eastern part of the state later. I sat for a little longer, then went to get cans of gasoline. I had already soaked the floors in the main rooms I wanted to focus on with gasoline. Now all that was left was to make the path outside. Early morning fires are virtually invisible, especially in West Texas. Ranchers always burn when the dew point is still low. Here in the middle of nowhere, the smoke would have to linger for a long time before anyone would report a possible problem. I stood and watched as the fire I had started began to burn. My memory returned to that ship. I was overwhelmed with visions. I felt hot, terrible heat. But I enjoyed the glow of the fire, its color. I heard screams and remembered that the house was empty. The visions took hold of me and I almost lingered too long. I jumped in my truck and drove a mile and a quarter until my tires hit the pavement. Then I went out and untied the net, carried it fifty yards into dry ground and hid it behind the bushes. It would take a long time for a person to find it and there were no tire tracks to link me to the location. Still high on adrenaline, I returned home, showered, and made myself something to eat. Misty was on my mind as I tried to decide what to tell the police when they arrived. If someone from the neighboring ranch noticed the smoke and realized it might be Jed's house, they might arrive sooner than I expected. However, on the way home, I did not hear a single sound of emergency vehicles. If Jed's body is found in a few days, I could get away with it. The problem was that there were many witnesses to our argument in the Bronco. It's unlikely that the police will leave me alone, and I could only hope that Jack wouldn't tell them what he told me. If I left any evidence at Jed's house, then I'm headed to jail. The next morning I woke up, as usual, after a restless night. I sat again, looking at the rising sun, which was turning from orange to yellow. For some reason, I fell asleep in a chair on the porch and dreamed about an accident on a destroyer. I saw Misty in the tall flames. Her image was ghostly, but her face was as beautiful and bright as always. She smiled and quietly said that she loved me, only me, and that she would take care of everything. Keep my love, dear, it is only yours. I'll take care of everything. When I woke up again, towards noon, something in this vision haunted me, but I could not understand what it was. Two days later they arrived. By then I was both surprised and delighted. Two detectives I had never seen before asked permission to enter. I played calmly, as it seemed to me, and offered them coffee, which they refused. 
Is Misty Simpson your wife, sir? They asked. This question was unexpected, and I'm sure it showed on my face. Yes, I replied, clearly surprised. Do you know where she is now? The female detective asked, and something seemed wrong to me in her question. She went to visit her sister in California, I answered, pausing. Then an uneasy feeling struck me. Why? I asked, already with panic in my voice. Is she okay? We regret to inform you, Mr. Simpson. I didn't hear any further. It took them several tries to get the news to me. Misty's car was found at the bottom of a ravine on a difficult curve near Henderson, Nevada. She was in the car. I mean, I didn't know why I started crying, but I didn't. I knew. Amid the chaos and turmoil in my mind, there was one thought that reminded me that I never cried for my shipmates. I don't know what exactly that said about me. I had to give the officers information about Misty's next of kin, even though I told them I would call myself. Suppressed by emotions unknown to me, I spent the entire day in a fog, as if in delirium. The vision of Misty from that dream became my ghost. The truck took me into town and my wallet bought me a case of beer and a bottle of Maker's Mark. It seemed that I had nothing to do with these actions. When I was drunk enough, I called Misty's father, Ralph, and her sister, Angie. They wanted to come to me to support me, but I asked them to wait until the morning. I was not ready to talk to anyone, to see anyone. They, of course, had many questions about why Misty was going to her sister in California without telling anyone. All I could say was I don't know. The sunset that evening did not appeal to me at all. I lay in bed, thinking. I lost Misty and nothing could bring her back. All thoughts of Jed disappeared, and I didn't care if I was accused of killing him. Nothing mattered now, even her cheating didn't bother me as much as before. I thought back to Misty and I's early years. I remember how she almost fell out of the tree, and how much my hand hurt when I held her wrist, trying to pull her up. I remember how she choked on her cola when something funny happened in one of the episodes of The Simpsons, and it all came out through her nose. We always watched that damn show because of my last name. Her last name. I remembered her connection with Jed. I remembered our wedding and that evening in the Bronco when I first realized that something was wrong between them. I then received a note from the waitress, and then Jack's words confirmed my suspicion. Something was wrong in their relationship. I remembered overhearing their conversation before intervening and the gunshot but it didn't seem so important now because she was dead. I remembered everything. But I remember almost nothing from Misty's funeral. My family and friends asked me a lot of questions, mostly concerned about my well-being. A week after Misty's funeral, I went to the sheriff's office and confessed to killing Jed Carruthers. The only truth was that I no longer trusted myself to be alone. Six months later, after numerous evaluations, I was sent to a psychiatric clinic upstate. I confessed to killing Jed in his bedroom. I explained in detail how we fought for the gun and how it went off accidentally while we were fighting. But this version did not match the crime scene, and by that time Jed's body or remains had never been found. I argued that it was his gun that we were fighting for. One of his pistols was still in the burnt safe. The therapist spent a lot of time convincing me that what I told the police was paracuses, an auditory hallucination caused by unresolved grief and ongoing trauma. It may also have been related to the inner ear. For the first two weeks, my aunt and uncle visited me. It was nice. They told me that Carruthers' parents had offered a million-dollar reward for any information about the whereabouts of their son Jed. I was tempted to tell them where his bones were so they could get the money. Towards the end of the third week, I had a surprise visitor, Angie, Misty's little sister. It seems my surprised look made her blush. Hi, Durin, she said uncertainty. How do they treat you here? Her question was not malicious and made me laugh, which eased the situation. We talked about things going on around town, how Bronco employees were doing volunteer work in Misty's memory and other things. I talked about my wife in a positive way. After her death, I no longer felt anger for her betrayal. Angie and I sat in awkward silence for a long time. It was me, she suddenly said, meeting my eyes. I wrote that note the waitress gave you. 
I wasn't sure if I heard her correctly. Yes, I know, she continued. Shock, huh? She giggled nervously. Angie looked guilty, but relieved at the same time. I couldn't figure it out. Finally, gathering her courage, she sat closer to me on the sofa. None of the hospital staff were watching us, but we were sitting in the hall. That girl, she said quietly. It was my friend Laura from school. We have been watching you for several days, waiting for the moment. When you walked into the place where Laura worked, she simply put on her uniform and walked towards you. Why didn't you call or write to me yourself? I asked the obvious question. I didn't want it to come from me, she replied, as if I should have understood that. Jack, the bartender at the Bronco, warned me. He didn't want to tell you directly because of your condition. He wanted someone to know that Misty was in trouble, but he didn't want to start a scandal. I still didn't understand, and apparently it was noticeable on my face. Angie blushed and looked down. I always liked you, Duran, she said nervously. I always liked it. I had a showdown with my sister, and then I found out that she was not in trouble, as Jack thought. She created this chaos for herself. I thought if you found out, well, I don't know what I was hoping for. Where is Jed now? I continued to play my role, despite her recognition. Only three people know about this. She suddenly became serious. You, me, and my friend Lara. I tried not to show any emotion on my face and raised an eyebrow. Angie moved even closer to me, almost sitting on my lap. Many people from the city came out to look for him. She continued quietly. You know, because of the award and everything, I saw footprints on the ground and dragged Laura with me. I had a feeling. The wind blew it away most of the way, but we eventually found it again. And there, less than 200 feet away, was Jed, or what was left of him. A lot of it was eaten, she added quietly. A lot of people were 50 or 60 yards apart. They couldn't see what we saw, but we couldn't stop and try to bury it again. She looked away sadly. Is this what happened to my sister? She asked sternly. I knew what she meant. No, I answered immediately. Her death was truly an accident, and one day I will tell you everything, but not now. Angie came once a month for the first year. I told her everything piece by piece. She asked questions, and I gradually answered. Over time, we began to talk less about the past and more about the future. Two years later, I was discharged. Misty was gone, and she would never be again. It was just me, the grass, the trees, and the dew, and I hated her for it. My therapist finally got me to admit it. After all, love and hate are two sides of the same coin. But Angie was waiting for me at my old house when they brought me in a taxi. The future we have been planning for the past two years was going to be slow to develop. She said many times that I needed to learn to trust people again, and that was my main problem. However, this did not mean that we could not date or be intimate. Her father, Ralph, was wary of me, especially when it came to his daughter. But I think by the time Angie and I got married three years later, I had won his trust just as she had won mine. I never forgot Misty, but I could never forgive her. Angie knew this and accepted it. She also loved me so much that she was willing to be with a broken person who continued to recover. Now I try to avoid sunrises and sunsets. Angie and I buried this ritual on the beach in Santa Barbara on our honeymoon. My tears were only caused by the strong wind that blew sand into my eyes. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one.